Why is it that you go in for a minor back surgery on this herniated disc, L4-5 in the lumbar spine, only to find out that six, 18, 24 months later, we've got a bulging disc creeping in at L5-S1. In today's video, we're gonna help you guys understand this because it is something that happens quite frequently. We get comments about it, and this particular video was taken from one such comment. So today, we're gonna to unpack it and help you understand if this has happened to you. And for those of you that haven't had a back surgery and you've just maybe had a previous herniation at L5-S1 or L4-5, this is gonna be relevant to you as well. They might've settled down, but then it comes back and we find that we have another MRI and all of a sudden now we've got two discs that are problematic. Why is this? Let's explain. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Michael Fatika, the lead osteopath and spine specialist here at Back in Shape. We help people around the UK and all over the world fix their back pain from home and get back in shape for the long term. And today we're taking one of the questions from our community and hopefully it's going to help many of you watching this video. Just before we get into the surgery, just to understand exactly where we're talking about, the most commonly injured or herniated discs in the lumbar spine are going to be the L45 disc, which is this one here, and the L5S1, the last two segments of our lumbar spine. And so these discs can become herniated, bulging, degenerate over time, but they are by far and away the most common discs that are going to be injured and the ones that we're primarily talking about in this particular video. One of the reasons that these discs are so frequently injured in the lower back is because of the way in which we strain our bodies on a daily basis. The average adult in the UK spends about 9.5 hours a day sitting, which means that there are people that are going to be way above that and many that are going to be on that point. And so it's important to understand that the action of sitting like so really compresses and strains these discs and takes them outside of their usual nice neutral position that is adopted when we're standing. And we'll get to this a little bit more later, but this is placing an inordinate amount of strain on those particular segments, which is why they are so frequently the ones that are associated with your back pain or your sciatic symptoms. So we'll talk quickly about surgery, but if you haven't had back surgery, maybe you've had a disc injury in the past, just skip over this section and get on to the next one. Now, when it comes to surgery, the most important thing to understand is that if we have this disc herniation here, the surgery is going to remove that bit. Let's talk about the microdiscectomy, which is going to be the most common one. Any surgery other than that, that is more invasive than that, things are even more complicated. In a point from a point of view of tissue damage and healing etc but even in this very very simple relatively safe form of surgery we have to understand that that disc being removed there or the bulging part is not healing the disc i repeat it is not healing the fundamental problem. It's kind of addressing the cause, but not really completely. And what I mean by that is there is a failure of the disc in its entirety when we get the disc bulge or herniation. And we might be in a position where the bulging disc is pressing on the nerve, which is giving us those more or less permanent symptoms or very, very high levels of symptoms, or maybe some emergency symptoms such as cord equina. And by removing that, yes, it addresses those elements of the symptoms, but it doesn't make the disc all of a sudden a healthy disc again. And when I say that, people are like, well, yeah, of course, but, but not of course, because sometimes that's not really effectively communicated. It's like, oh, we've done the surgery, you're out of pain, the problem's fixed. And that is one of the base level assumptions that really leads people down the wrong path. The fundamental problem, if we will, is that the disc was injured at all in the first place. And that is the problem that we are looking to address. The disc was injured so much so that ordinarily, as we press down on a nice healthy disc, it's gonna bulge a little bit and then it's gonna spring back off depending on the load and the strain that's put through it. That's perfectly normal functioning of a healthy disc. But yours is perhaps damaged to such a degree that even when we lie down and have significantly less strain going through the discs, it's still showing that little bulge down there. And if we pause to take a moment to understand what is exactly happening, if we grab one of the healthy discs here, we can see very clearly that we've got the fluid in the middle, which is the nucleus, that's this little solid block here. And then around the edges here, we've got layers. You guys can hopefully pick that up on the camera here, but those layers are the annulus fibrosis, lots of layers. And so that when we squash down on this disc, it bulges out because those ligaments, like all ligaments, have a degree of spring, a degree of give to them. And that's a fundamentally normal process. But when we have injured the disc, what we have is that we've broken through some of those layers fundamentally. And now we've got fewer layers restricting this disc's path out this way compared to here. And like with anything, if we've got pressure in the system, the pressure is going to try and escape through the path of least resistance, which is why these things often get worse. And so to round that off, we are dealing with, in the case of the disc herniation, a loss of the ability of that segment of the spine to deal with and bear load in a functional way. And so after we've had our surgery, in this case, the L4-5 disc has been operated on and removed, or the part of the disc that was bulging has been removed, we are no longer suffering perhaps from some elements of the symptoms, 
but we have not healed the disc. The big question we need to ask, even before the surgery, and whether we're having surgery or not, is why is the disc not healing in the first place? For the vast majority that undergo things like microdisectomies, it's not the first port of call. It's been a discussion, maybe it's been floated a couple of times, and we end up having it. But the simple fact of the matter is we have been doing things every single day to prevent the recovery of this herniated disc, to prevent it from going through a normal healing process. And that is something that has to be acknowledged and so infrequently is. We need to understand that once we've got a degree of that disc bulge, we're experiencing back pain or sciatica. The movements and the way in which we pressurize this disc is going to dictate how much strain is going to be focused on the weak area. So if we're doing things that involve a lot of forward bending, instead of compressing down in a neutral position where the disc is going to want to move in equal directions in equal, with equal force, if we're squashing down on the front part of the disc here, all of the force, and often magnified, is driving that central disc material towards the back part of the vertebra. So instead of this little weak point dealing with an even distribution of all of the load coming through symmetrically, it's now dealing with a loaded sort of force coming all through the back. Half of the disc is, relatively speaking, less active in this resisting of the central disc material, the nucleus, moving out. And if we make this even further ex exacerbated, let's say, as we go down to pick up one sock, for example, we now focus all of the pressure to one quadrant, this direction, as we forward bend and twist a little bit. Make no mistake, if you've injured your back or you've got your most recent flare-up or the flare-up that kicked this whole thing off, the injury, from picking up a sock, or picking up a water bottle, you did not have a healthy back before you injured it. And we have to appreciate that so many of the ways in which we're doing things on a daily basis are constantly getting this spine, this section that's trying to heal, irritated, aggravated, in perhaps low level ways that you kind of maybe get away with and sometimes don't, but it's a constant bombardment. We're constantly picking the scab that's trying to heal in this section. It might be that we've got pets, we've got young children, toddlers, infants. It might be that we've got older family members that we have to look after. It might be that we just have to still do a job and we just dose up on painkillers and crack on. It might be that we've got a pet, a dog, a cat that needs feeding, needs walking. All of these sorts of things are putting stress and strain on our bodies. And if we don't have good spinal control, then we're going to constantly be aggravating things. So if we take a step back and think about what we've just discussed, we, we might have had a surgery or not. Maybe we've kind of started to heal a little bit on our own. We've kind of stabilized a little bit. But then we found that a couple of months or years later, we've got another disc that's bothered. Does it really make sense now? Because if we have continued to do these things, not looked after our back, continued to bend forwards and backwards and twisting and this, that, the other, and putting the spine under strain, is it any wonder that the L45 is now an L45 and an L5S1 that have become injured? The things that caused the very first disc injury and that prevented it from recovering, that led us to a procedure perhaps, are still there before the procedure and after the procedure to continue creating that same sort of repetitive strain injury to the other segments in the lower back. You don't have the capacity to move L4-5 or L5-S1. You can just move the whole thing. You don't have the control. So it's only going to make sense that it's going to start to wear and tear on the segments above the surgery and below the surgery. Now this next criticism might be true in this particular case, it might be true in your case. It's not true for everybody, I'm sure, but it is true in enough. And that is that the post-care after surgery is sometimes quite awful. So much so that I've had conversations with patients over the years and members where they've had a microdisectomy, for example, at L45, and they've got their physio booked in for 12 weeks time, and they've got their book, their, their appointment with the consultant to see how the physio's gone for 10 weeks. And it's like, how did that even happen? So the consultant has a week, two weeks has an appointment, two weeks before you start your physio to discuss how your physio was after the surgery. This kind of silliness and this kind of just bad support often leads patients into a very difficult situation. And it's just a failure of the system, unfortunately. I don't necessarily believe it's any individual's fault. It's just that the system is not particularly good over here in the UK anyway. And it doesn't happen to everyone. But I think for a lot of the comments that we get online, those of you that are struggling, perhaps it's happened to you. Not to go off on too much of a tangent here, but we very recently shot a full podcast on spinal surgery. And if you're someone that is considering this, is gonna have it in a couple of months or has it scheduled, if you've got it maybe tomorrow or yesterday, or you've had it a little while ago, then definitely check that podcast out. There'll be a link down in the description because that will really help you better understand what we're gonna be dealing with going forwards and what we can maybe avoid and how we can deal with things in the best possible way. Considering the fact that in a lot of cases, the post-surgical support is not necessarily there. In a lot of cases, the education around back health and the sorts of things that we've even discussed in very, very brief detail in this video haven't perhaps been discussed before is very easy 
to see how an injury to L5-S1 can progress into an injury of L4-5 and L5-S1. It's very easy to see how we can perhaps re-herniate the disc we thought was fixed, how we can re-injure the segments above or below the herniated disc that was intervened with on, from a microdisectomy. We can see how these sorts of things happen. And so really we want to say, okay, how do I actually go about avoiding those sorts of things happen going forwards? The most important thing to understand is that unlike an injury to the knee or the ankle, with back pain, we have that education. It needs to be in place because we can't put those things in a cast or the back in a cast like we can with those other injuries and prevent you from messing them up on a daily basis for six, eight, 12 weeks. We have to acknowledge that you have to deal with your back every single day. So a good amount of education is really, really important in the early days and ongoing. We need to understand that we need to to start from a point of spinal stability rather than this fruitless and endless mobility exercises with things like cat's cow, child's pose, knee hugs, rocking, bending one way or other because your spine is feeling stiff. Of course, the thing is not feeling very good. It's injured and we need to focus on stability. Exercises like the core five for spine health, which were covered in a recent podcast, focus on you actually learning to stabilize and protect these segments on a daily basis with simple movements that are true to real life. Movements like the squat, the hip hinge, and the step up are movements that you will be doing regardless of whether you've had surgery or not and whether you've had surgery a week ago or six months ago. You will be doing those movements every single day. We can either roll the dice and hope for the best and maybe they'll flare up and maybe they won't, or we can start to learn how to perform them. Maintaining a neutral spine through the entirety of range of motion and starting to understand when we are losing appropriate composure and stopping before that point, before the point at which the back goes like that and creates trouble. You must understand that that stabilization work is the pathway forwards to restoring stability and integrity to your lumbar spine. And although you might need to use easier versions of those particular exercises, and there are full tutorials on the website you can check out to break them down and make them harder, you must understand that that is what is getting you better. That is the thing that literally transforms your body. On the other hand, we can also do, also, not instead, also do some element of relief-based work. And relief-based work is the kind of stuff that is relieving the strain on those discs. It's an antidote to the fact that we have to walk through daily life every day, putting strain on the back in ways we can't avoid, as mentioned earlier, unlike the wrist where we can put a cast on it. And so using things like the towel decompression, the bed decompression, to take a bit of pressure off those herniated discs on a moment to moment basis, a couple of times a day. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it can be really helpful. Doing things like contrast bathing, because congestion in around these segments of the spine down here, that is what is going to contribute to much of your symptoms on a daily basis between each of the flare-ups or specific offending movements. Understanding that keeping the hips nice and mobile through some sensible, spine-focused hip stretching, and by spine-focused, I mean not moving the spine, as so many people when they do a hip flexor stretch or a hamstring stretch will just round or arch the lower back, as well as move the hip. This is ineffective for the hip stretching, and it's also provocative for the lower back. But doing some of that, although it's got short-lived benefits, is still worthwhile doing, because it takes about four, five, six minutes to do, and you can do it multiple times a day. Even things like going for short walks are helpful in easing the excess congestion in this area. But we have to understand that relief-based work is not getting getting us better. Relief-based work is that you relieve the stress and strain of daily life and of the exercises. And we discuss this interplay between the strain that exercises and life puts on your back and your level of competence in a very recent podcast, talking about the back recovery journey that you all will go through and some of the peaks and troughs and pitfalls that you want to really watch out for. And I would definitely check that one out, link down in the description later on. Ultimately, the reason that we re-herniate or injure another disc, even after we've had what was supposed to be a problem-solving intervention, such as a microdisectomy, is that we're not dealing with the underlying problems. The underlying reason that that disc has been strained in the first place and that that disc hasn't recovered effectively going forwards. And if we take a step back to acknowledge that, and start to make some changes, get educated about how the spine works and the importance of focusing on stability in the short and medium term to rebuild strength and control over that spine, we're going to find that we can protect our back more effectively on a daily basis from the things that we all have to do in spite of having sometimes very severe back pain and sciatica. 
we'll find that that allows us to gain some momentum on the healing front. And we'll then find that later on, as we progress further still, we can actually use the rehabilitative exercises that we've been doing in the early stages to improve our technical competence, to drive the healing, the adaptation, and the transformation of the health and integrity of our lumbar spine itself, literally making this stuff stronger again. We can leverage relief-based practices such as those discussed, and there's a full routine linked down in the description, a back pain relief routine you can check out. And if we do all of that consistently, week in, week out, leveraging tutorials, recording yourself when you're doing exercises to check your form, you will find that you start to make significant improvement and inroads into the amount of daily pain that you're experiencing. You don't get to choose which part of the symptoms go first, but you will find that things start to get better and you start to be able to do the things that you couldn't do before without pain. If you need more help with this, there's a number of resources that can support you. We've got the website with hundreds of articles and videos to help you understand these sorts of things. A variety of tutorials on the various exercises that we've already discussed will show you how to do these particular exercises. And of course, for a lot of you, you'll be able to do it on your own. But for some of you, you need that extra support and you don't want to leave things to chance. So you've got the full membership to the Back in Shape program, which gives you the structure and the support from the team here to guide you along that process and get your back in shape again. You can learn more about all of these things on the website. As always, if you made it this far through the video, do consider sharing this with someone else that you know is struggling. And thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next one.